The financial sector turmoil continues. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Equity futures down by 1.9% on the S&P. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, coming up, Credit Suisse stock plunging to a fresh record low. Top shareholder Saudi National Bank ruling out further assistance, sending equities down and European banks lower, much lower. We begin with the big issue. The turmoil continues. Yesterday, leadership at Credit Suisse tried to inspire calm. So far, it's pretty calm. Um, we even saw material good inflows yesterday still. Um, also, you know, I had a client meeting which was very positive on that one. So, so far it's calm, but I think it's early days to, to look at it. And today, their top shareholder did anything but inspire confidence. Absolutely not, for many reasons, outside the simplest reason, which is regulatory and statutory. We now own 9.8% um, of the bank. If we go above 10%, all kinds of new rules kick in, whether it be by our regulator or the European regulator or the Swiss regulator and we're not inclined to get into a new regulatory regime. Credit Suisse down 26% this morning alone. Joining us now to discuss, John Hancox, Emily Rowland, Evercourse, Julian, Emmanuel. Emily, first to you. Wow, what a morning so far. What's your reaction to it? Yeah, John, idiosyncratic risks are certainly bubbling to the surface in areas that were weak to start. And look, this is the way that every economic cycle ends unfortunately the fed tightens until something breaks and you know there's going to be a confidence issue when the fed here pushes you to the edge of a cliff and that's what we're seeing in some of these weaker names you know european equities or european banks had outperformed u.s banks by 40 percent over the last six months and to us that really didn't jive with the macroeconomic backdrop the moves that central banks are making in terms of tightening and we're seeing some issues certainly here bubbling to the surface what a difference a week makes. Last week, we woke up, we were talking about Chairman Powell opening the door to 50 basis points. Torsten's lock for Polo was talking about no landing. Torsten, moments ago, early this morning, said, when the facts change, my view changes from no landing to hard landing. Julian, do you agree? 100 percent. It is absolutely remarkable that Chair Powell teased that 50 basis point hike on Tuesday and 24 hours later, uh, the financial stress began and obviously accelerated. The problem here is that, you know, while we want to say that there is an idiosyncratic nature to what's going on, uh, you know, three banks uh, having been uh, shut uh, in the U.S. and now obviously the stress we're seeing uh, in Switzerland, uh, you know, when does it become more than idiosyncratic? Uh, and I think that's part of the pressure that we're seeing now, uh, particularly play out in the rates markets. Julian, I don't want to put you in a tough spot, but I've got to ask the question. Credit Suisse, how important is that to the financial system? Well, I, I think it's important psychologically, if nothing else. And again, uh, you know, the, the long history of Swiss banking is that there ends up being a, a forced marriage if it comes down to that. And we're not saying that that's the case. Uh, but look, uh, it, it is a name that's been around for decades, and that is definitely something of pretty deep significance. Emily, when was the last time a client asked you about a no landing? You know, John, it's funny. When we started to hear rumblings of a no landing, we, Matt Miskin and I sort of thought to ourselves, well, that actually isn't a thing, because without landings, we wouldn't have economic cycles. So that really has not been our view. You know we watched all of the leading indicators really closely. You know, we watch things like the yield curve inversion. I know it's starting to sound like a broken record here. We felt like it was a broken record for a really long time because we've had this almost sort of never ending late cycle environment where the economic data, especially in the beginning of this year, was coming in pretty decent. You start to hear these rumors or these thoughts around a no landing. You know, to us, it's, it's unfortunately been our view this whole time that we are going to see this not ending well, um, owning higher quality bonds, being patient here, waiting for risk assets to become on sale has really been, you know, our logic here. And that's starting to play through today. Emily, the policymaker's got to make a move here. Chair Powell's next week. ECB President Christine Lagarde is tomorrow morning. 
I've got no idea what she's going to do. She had previously seemingly pre-committed to a 50 basis point hike. I think it's worth pointing out that still we have a split on Wall Street as to what the Fed's going to do next week. Yes, Credit Suisse is down about 29 percent. That, by the way, is another record low. Just moments ago, 157. We're at 159 right now. I'm looking through the European banking system. Socgen's down 12 percent. BNP's down 10, close to 11 percentage points lower. And yet here's the split right now for pause. Wells Fargo, Goldman, Barclays, other, they say the Fed is done. Mm -hmm. This market screams the Fed is done. Elsewhere, Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, Citi, they all say this Fed is still going to hike next week. This is what Neil yeah. Datter of Renmark had to say. Today's CPI inflation data make it clear that the effort to quell inflation is far from complete. Had it not been for SVP, the Fed would likely have moved 50 basis points in March. Instead, I see them going 25. Emily, where on earth are you on this Fed next week? By the way, uh, a week is like a lifetime now. I feel like we have a full economic cycle, like in a week's time. So there are still some kind of moving parts here. But, you know, potential banks globally do have a history of pausing or cutting after these financial events occur in the markets. And clearly we're in a much more difficult place right now, given elevated inflation. And I think if the Fed does pause next week, they do risk coming out more dovish and potentially spurring a risk on move in markets. And let's be honest here, risk assets still are not really reflecting a lot of distress. High yield bond spreads at about 469 basis points this morning. The longer term average is 500. You know, we're looking at a weaker dollar versus riskier currencies globally, which is helping foreign markets. We're also seeing a period in which things like, you know, Bitcoin trading at 25,000. So we're really not seeing markets fully reflecting the potential for recession here. So I think that probably keeps the Fed on edge here. I'd, I'd give it a sort of 50-50 between zero and 25 basis points. Julian, what about you? What would spook you more if we got no hikes from the ECB tomorrow or if we actually got a 50 basis point move from the ECB tomorrow? Well, I, I think that is a really difficult uh, uh, problem here. Uh, I would say no hike. However, what we have to step back and recall is, again, going back a week ago, there was absolutely no ink, inkling from any central banker, at least of all Fed Chair Powell, that the kind of uh, events that have unfolded over the last week would, in fact, unfold. Uh, and when we think about it, looking forward to next Wednesday, Look, our view is that the Fed's going to go 25. We would prefer that they pause. Uh, but then again, part of that is the perception of putting the Fed put back into play. But what we would say to that is that there really is no way to separate the concept of financial stability from inflation fighting as much as we would like to think that there is in a theoretical academic world. And part of our view that we're likely to go into a recession either late this year or early next is that it, that will be more of the catalyst to bring inflation down, which is what we're trying to do in the first place. 160 on Credit Suisse. We're down about 20 8%. If you are just tuning in, you're seeing these moves, wondering what on earth is going on. A little bit earlier on this morning, Bloomberg caught up with the top shareholder in Credit Suisse, the Saudi National Bank, and the chairman was asked about whether he'd provide more assistance to the name. The answer, absolutely not. He went on to say, for many reasons outside the simplest reason, which is regulatory and statutory concerns. Of course, once you cross that 10% threshold, there is a different degree of regulation they would have to face. And right now, they're just below that level. Though if they keep their stake the same by the time we get to today's close, that might change as well. Credit Suisse down by 28%. Elsewhere, European banking names are getting hammered too. Sockgen, BNP, both down by anywhere between 11 and 13%. Kelly Lines down in D.C. following all of this. Kelly, we talked about the U.S. names to close out last week. This morning, it's all about Europe. It is. And, John, we just have to think about the cocktail here. You take a bank that has been plagued with issues for years, from scandals to outflows to struggles with profitability. Then you take its largest shareholder saying absolutely not to providing more support in the future, potentially, for many reasons. And you put them together in a moment at which this market is on a knife's edge, looking for any sign of more risk in the banking system, waiting for another shoe to drop. And this is what you get, John, a record low on Credit Suisse. Right now we have a 159 print down 29% on the day. Then when it comes to credit, their 2026 bonds uh, plunging to distress levels. We have credit default swaps we haven't seen since crisis era with the Greek banks back during that country's debt crisis. And of course, that is bleeding through here to the U.S. as well, where we are fresh off multiple bank failures of Silicon Valley Bank and 
and Signature. And it, that is what you are seeing showing up in pre-market trading. The Energy Select Sector Spider ETF as a whole, which gauges how that sector is going to do come the opening bell right now down about 3%. This is bleeding across two big to fail banks and those regional banks as well. Right now, PacWest, for example, down about 13%. Not only are they contending with any kind of systemic risk that could stem from Credit Suisse, but also the specter of more regulation, because we also understand now, according to our reporting, that the Fed is looking at tightening its rules for banks between 100 and $250 billion in assets, which could mean higher capital and liquidity requirements coming down the pike, John. Kelly Lines, thank you. This is where we are. 40 basis point move at the front end of the curve. Your two-year yield right now, 385. The curve, twos versus tens negative 40 basis points, a week ago, negative 110. So this curve is re-steepening, taking away some of that inversion, but it's being led by this massive rally at the front end of the curve as we take away Fed hikes and price in Fed cuts. Now, Emily, given what I've just explained is developing in this bond market, is that bullish or bearish for risk assets for equity markets from your point of view? It's bearish, John. This is the way that every single cycle ends. You see a re-steepening of the yield curve right before the recession happens as markets start to price in the Fed cutting interest rates. So the re-steepening of the curve is, is pointing to us, to the, to the way that this ends. We see the entire yield curve shifting down over the course of this year as the long end starts to price in slower economic growth, inflation fears turn into growth fears, the short end moves lower at a more precipitous pace than the long end of the curve. And by the way, what this all means is this is a great environment to be embracing yield. We look at that back up in bond yields over the past year and a half as creating a really attractive entry point, very competitive opportunity. It's all about income. You know, John, I've been talking about bonds for a while, but let's go. Julian, let's go in a bond market and let's go right now. What a move we're seeing develop, particularly at the front end of the curve. Julian, from your perspective, here's the important question. There's a lot of people out there that want to play the recovery in this equity market before we've even experienced the recession. Is that a mistake? Too early, John. Uh, from our point of view, uh, we've been very consistent in our message that history shows that bear markets do not bottom prior to the onset of a recession. Obviously, at Hyman's view, and our view is that you are going to have a recession. Uh, and history, again, would say that uh, caution is warranted. Uh, we do expect a test of those October lows sometime near mid-year. And again, this whole idea that because yields are backing up, uh, that's a positive. That's incorrect. Uh, as Emily pointed out, the, the correlation between stocks and bonds has flipped, consistent with crisis times such as 1998, 1987, and 1974. Too early, we'll get there towards mid-year. We'll continue this conversation. Julian, Emily, sticking with us. Big move in the bond market. Treasuries rallying, yields lower on a two-year by more than 40 basis points, 3.83 on a two-year. In the equity market, one stop, getting everyone's attention right now. Credit Suisse is down by almost 30%. The new low for this morning, the new all-time low for this stock is 156. And right now, we're just short of 158 at about 157-ish. Coming up. The latest data competing for the Fed's attention. You have to understand, we had a forecast of a second half recession. We're likely now to have an increased probability of that as a result of the developments that we're seeing. That conversation up next. This is not a systemic credit crunch. It is not a massive decline in the underlying macroeconomic environment. It's a shallow type recessionary environment. So it takes time to bring all these things to coalesce, to bring down the rate of inflation and the rate of growth enough to rebalance the labor market. They're looking at trying to separate the two mm -hmm. concepts. It's regulatory approach. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's regulatory approach to policy versus its policy with regard to inflation in the labor market. The last dose of data rolling in ahead of the Fed's March meeting. It's the economic indicators versus financial stability. Wall Street taking sides. Goldman, Wells, Barclays, they say the Fed is done. On the other side, still looking for more hikes this month. Morgan Stanley, City, B of A. Mike McKee, next week is a tough call. It is a tough call. You've got Deutsche City and PNC, at least for the moment. 
with 50 basis point hike calls. Now, those, those are probably going to change, I would imagine, before we get to next Wednesday, a whole week could go by before the Fed meets. It's going to be tougher for the ECB with everything that's going on. But we did get some numbers today that support the idea of no more than a 25 basis point cut, and that is the PPI coming in much softer than anticipated, actually on a month-to-month -month basis lower. The uh, core is flat, and X trade, which is basically the margins for retailers and wholesalers, up by a a lot less than anticipated. You look at what happened with Empire, tertiary index, but a huge drop there. New orders really went down. Retail sales a little slower, although the control group uh, shows Americans are still spending, but maybe the story is beginning to play out that we have spent enough money. There is a sort of uh, maybe bad news hidden in the PPI that people aren't paying attention to. The PCE is the Fed's index that follows inflation. And one of the things that's bigger in the PCE report is medical care services and medical care services in the PPI, which will translate into PCE, they're rising. And so that's going to put some upward pressure on the PCE. We'll see how that turns out. But that didn't come out till after the Fed meeting, so it won't have an influence. I did put in a chart of Empire just to show the how much the <laughs> the whole thing fell down, John. It's really quite a, uh, Amazing. Quite a, a, a change in the, the way things have been going in the New York State. But look at the volatility. That's the hard part, too. How do you know what's going to happen oh, month Mike, to month? Not just the data. Let's talk about the bond market. Have you ever seen the two-year in the Treasury market trade like a penny stock? Yeah, that's it's, the story of the last week. Look at this morning. And, and somebody asked me this morning, uh, you know, what signals should the Fed take out of it? I don't know that you can take anything out of it at this moment because they're being pushed around by all sorts of developments on a, a ba almost an hourly basis. So how do you know what it is telling you? It's telling you that the market thinks there's less confidence in something. Is it the economy? Is it inflation? Is it the banking system? Uh, and so it is going to be an interesting discussion for them uh, next Wednesday, and I would sure like to be a fly on the wall in Frankfurt tomorrow at, oh, the, dear at me. the ECB. Mike, can we finish there just briefly? I mentioned this earlier. I'd love you to respond to it as well. We talk a lot about how Chairman Powell doesn't want to be Burns. He wants to be Volcker. Do you think President Lagarde's worried about being Trichet? And I'm thinking of those hikes back in 2011, 2008. Uh, it's a different situation because in this case they know inflation is established and rising there, but I'm sure she has that example in mind. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. This move right here, two-year yield, down by 48 basis points. Moments ago, even more than that, 376, 377 right now on a two-year in America. In Germany, we dropped by more than 40 basis points, 242. Moments ago, it was more than that. Julian Emanuel. Emily Rowland back with us for a final thought. Julian, defense. Treasuries are working for now. I stress for now because I've got no idea what happens later. On the equity side, you say defensive. Healthcare, staples, energy. And as soon as I saw the word energy, I wanted to ask you, Julian, energy? How does that fit in? So energy has been consistently the only sector whose valuation already discounts what we're seeing on the screen. Uh, by most rights, uh, you're discounting uh, across the, the universe of stocks uh, WTI in the low 60s. Now, that doesn't preclude that that's a stopping point, but for us, the, the valuation edge is there. And frankly, a lot of investors have given up on the sector. And of course, we still have the potential for the boost via the China reopening. Emily, have you given up on the sector? Yeah, John, as you know, uh, we missed that one when uh, commodities were, were rallying. But to us, it's pretty remarkable to see commodities really breaking down here, breaking through support. You know, given the element of China reopening that Julia Julian mentioned, you know, that's been a, a key support for, for commodities, uh, for non-U.S. equities that we see really fading here in this market. So we agree that those more defensive sectors should hold in better. Uh, we've remained overweight technology, your classic, you know, S&P 500 tech sector, not your growth at any price, unreasonable, unprofitable growth companies. And we're also seeing a bid for that. Amazingly, quality is finally coming back here. Quality, the best performing factor now year to date. We think that makes sense. Pair quality, pair it with defense, own high quality bonds. That's the playbook for 2023. Looking at energy right now, the underlying Commodity struggling this morning. WTI earlier this morning below 70 for the first time since December 21. Moments ago, Brent crude a drop below 75. First time since 2021 also. Emily, Julian, 
long week already. Thanks for being with us <laughs> this morning. Thank long, you. long week. I've said it repeatedly all week. In a world where a bank can fail in seemingly 24 hours, a week is a long, long time to get to Chair Powell next week. Equity futures right now on the S&P down 1.8%. We had some breaking news just moments ago. I want to get to Kayleigh for more. Hey, Kayleigh. Yeah, John, breaking news around First Republic, another one of those regional lenders that have been, has been in hyper focus in recent days. Shares now down 19 percent in pre-market trading after it was cut to junk by S&P ratings on outflow risk. S&P saying it thinks outflow risk remains elevated, get this, despite the actions of federal banking regulators and the bank actively increasing its borrowing availability. The S&P saying we expect increased wholesale borrowings to further weigh on net interest margin and First Republic right Right now, falling like a rock, John, down about 20% in pre-market. Katie Lice will no doubt stay on top of that. Katie, stay close into the opening bell about eight minutes away. So here's the story for you if you are just tuning in. Credit Suisse is down by 29%. Sub-160, a breakthrough two a little bit earlier this morning. If that wasn't dramatic enough, a break of 190, 180, 170, 160. Earlier on, in the last 10 minutes or so, 156, that's an all-time low. Their top shareholder, who owns just under 10%, of the overall company was asked if they'd provide more assistance. The Saudi National Bank chairman turned around and told Bloomberg, absolutely not, for many reasons outside the simplest reason, which is regulatory and statutory. So that's the latest from them. You see it bleed through this market into the European names. Socgen, BNP, take a pick. Socgen down almost 13%. BNP, the French banks have been struggling all morning. BNP's down about 11%. And you see it priced into the front end of the curve. We are just taking back rate hikes and pricing in rate cuts. Both sides of the Atlantic right now. In the Treasury market, the two-year is down almost 50 basis points, 376. In Germany, the two-year is down almost 50 basis points, 237. Chairman Powell's next week. Christine Lagarde is tomorrow morning. Coming up next on this program, the morning calls and later, Bob Michael, JP Morgan in the studio, six minutes away. Four minutes away from the opening bell. Futures down by 1.7%. Let's get you some morning calls. First up from City, upgrading truists to buy, saying the bear case is flawed but presents an attractive buying opportunity. UBS says this, initiating coverage on Western Alliance with a buy rating, calling credit concerns overblown. That stock is down 7.4%. And finally, Credit Suisse upgrading Charles Schwab to outperform, saying headwinds seem manageable and close to peaking. That stock's up by 7 tenths of 1%. Coming up on this program, prepare for a hard landing. That's the warning from Bob Michael of JP Morgan Asset Management. That conversation is up next with futures down 1.7%. Let's get to work. About 20 seconds away from the opening bell. Equity futures down by 1.7% on the Nasdaq, off by a little more than one full percentage point. The Russell, as you know by, by now, is heavily weighted to the financial sector. The Russell futures right now down about 3% or so. This equity market story, a real struggle through most of this morning. Good morning to you. Switch up the board and get to the bond market. Yields look a little something like this on a 10-year in America. Your yield as follows. Down 23 basis points, 345 on a two-year yield. We are down a whole lot lower than that this morning, aggressively lower. Last week, this time last week, through five. This morning, south of four. That's a massive turnaround. And who wants to be President Lagarde tomorrow? Euro dollar, 105.24, negative about two full percentage points. We were expecting a 50 basis point move, and now I've got to be honest with you, I've got absolutely no idea what Christine Lagarde and this ECB does tomorrow, that Governing Council two-day meeting begins today. Crude has had a really difficult time, difficult this morning, it's down 4.4%. $68 a barrel right now on WTI, a break of 70 a little bit earlier for the first time since 2021. One sector to watch at the open is the financials. Fresh turmoil across the Atlantic weighing on the US banks. First Republic leading the regionals lower after getting a junk rating. Kelly Lines has more. Hi, Kelly. 
Yeah, John, down 22% right now in the first moment of trading. That junk rating from S&P coming as the ratings agency warned of the still remaining risk of outflows despite the action from regulators and what the bank itself has done. S&P saying that they believe First Republic's deposit race is more concentrated than most large regional U.S. banks. So it is definitely getting hit the hardest today, but those other regional banks are not immune to the selling pressure either. PacWest down 13%, Western Alliance down by 7%, and this is even bleeding through to the big guys gone. John, the likes of J.P. Morgan, Goldman, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, all down to the tune of three and a half to nearly five percent this morning, despite the fact that these banks, seen as too big to fail, are actually benefiting from the turmoil we are seeing in regional banks in that they are getting a rush of deposits. Bank of America getting 15 billion dollars uh, in new deposits in just a matter of days. So these banks, in theory, are emerging, emerging as winners in terms of deposits from this turmoil, but certainly no banking stock is a winner on the day today, John. It's not all doom and gloom out there, Kaylee. It's not, at least not for the south side. UBS initiating coverage on Western Alliance with a buy rating, saying markets are mispricing its earnings power. The analyst goes on to write, quote, we think sources of mispricing include contagion risk from the Silicon Valley Bank failure, with shares pricing in something more dire. Given our earnings outlook and the current value Evaluation, we believe the risk reward skews to the upside. I imagine they wrote that before we saw developments this morning with this stock. Credit Suisse is down by almost 30% this morning. Shares hitting a new record low after the largest shareholder said absolutely not to a bigger piece of the pie. Shanali Basak has more. Hey, Shanali. John, we've been taking a look at Credit Suisse for a long time now, and if there's any silver lining when it comes to the Credit Suisse story, really what we're looking at here is the idea that they do have a large shareholder. And the large shareholder, when it comes to the Saudi National Bank, the reason they're not doubling down, as they give you in the last 24 hours, is regulatory reasons. But with that said, there's a big question here, and it's a risk management question. What is the floor to Credit Suisse's stock? The question here is, as we've seen in the last couple of weeks here is that the situation that has looked easing in the past can deteriorate very quickly. The good news for Credit Suisse is my in terms of my conversations with money managers is that the idea that they have gotten inflows when you look at the global banking kind of crisis and pressures we see on the system overall. I would say if you take a look if you want to draw any parallels with what's happening in the United States and what's happening abroad what your funding base looks like is just as important as who your clients are. Are. The fact that Credit Suisse is so global, their money might be a little bit stickier when you look at their clients in Asia, but remember, those clients are also under pressure. When you look at First Republic, and part of the reason here that it was downgraded was not just the fact that its funding base is under pressure, it's the idea that its client base is so concentrated. There's also the question here of the level of systemic risk you're taking on and the fact here that Credit Suisse is a globally systemic financial institution. Now the ripple effects that that would have to the market are a big question mark but I would remind you and everybody here that this has been a story for many 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 months. It is just hitting now a new turn uh, and that turn is that new low not only in the stock price but also that record widening of the CDS spreads. When I talk to money managers these are no longer becoming a attractive levels to be buying at. It gets harder to make those trades. Uh, that would have been a trade you made earlier this year or even last year. But, you know, these are questions to be asking the market about now. How do you, how do you buy this market? It's a distressed debt story already. Shanali, thank you. Thank you for that. I've said this repeatedly over the last few weeks, the last few hours as well. This is a story that's been building not just over the last few years, but over the last decade, arguably, with this name. But I'd go beyond saying this is about shareholders, leadership, people who work there. We all know some tremendous people who work for this institution will find it increasingly difficult to be engaged this morning with this kind of stuff going on. Joining us now, I'm really pleased to say, with some monster moves in this bond market, Bob Michael of JP Morgan Asset Management. Bob, you're looking for a hard landing now. It's a real change. Let's talk about what's developed in the last week. Can you just describe, give me some insight to what it's been like for you personally over the last week, just working in and out of this market? Well, if you go back about six or seven days ago, we were facing a lot of criticism that we were too conservative, that we were expecting recession, we didn't own high yield, we were in very high quality um, assets and extending the durations of our portfolios. How could we do that? The Fed had to keep going to six, seven percent. Uh, you also look at the low unemployment, wages going up. This was a soft landing. Uh, we kept thinking, no, no, the long and variable cumulative and lagged impacts of tightening would catch up. And they have. It, it's come on very, very fast. 
Uh, I don't know that we're particularly surprised. There was tremendous liquidity sloshing around in the system. That's being taken out. We always knew there would be a hard adjustment. Uh, but now it's starting to get painful. You've had dry powder. Have you allocated any of that, or do you believe this is the beginning of something bigger? Dan Iverson of PIMCO called this a multi-month process. Is this the beginning of something bigger for you? A absolutely. Um, if you think about where we were a year ago, the Fed was just starting its rate hiking cycle. So over the next couple quarters, you're going to get those long and variable cumulative and lagged impacts hitting the market further. So I, I think this is the tip of the iceberg. I think there's a lot more consolidation, a lot more pain yet to come. So you put your money into the highest quality assets you can find, whether it's government bonds or high quality corporates and securitized credit. You didn't like high yield. I imagine you don't like it now. Can we put some numbers on things though if we can? High yield spreads were through 400 basis points in the last month. We were yeah. literally there just the other <clears> week. <throat> we're north of that level right now. You've heard the people, I've heard the people that come on this show. They say it's a high quality index. They said a story's changed for high yields. Spreads won't gap out that much this time at a downturn. What do you say back to them? I say recession is inevitable. The low and high yield or the wide in spreads is always during recession. I don't know if it happens before year end or early next year. I'll be patient and wait. What should be disturbing to a lot of those investors is that the problems we're seeing now are in the investment grade market. It's with investment grade banks. It's with banks that had very wealthy client bases. Those are the ones that have come under attack. So it's disturbing for anyone in the credit space. So numbers, it's not 500 that gets it done for you. I imagine it's not six. Is it's a it seven? minimum of 800. Minimum of 800 minimum basis of points. 800. We've always been uh, to 800 over minimum in recession. If I think about all the funding that's gone on over the last three years, the amount of liquidity sloshing around in the system, um, we expect more problems. Is it the last three or the last 10? The last three years or the last decade that we need to undo? It's a lot of the last three years, but I think we're leaving the last decade behind. I, I think, look, the, the pleasant way to look at it is we had a pandemic, we had an overwhelming policy response. Now we've got to take out a lot of that liquidity. You're going to have a painful adjustment, but there are positive things ahead. There's a whole generational transformation to the millennials. So we could see higher highs and higher lows in central bank rates and, and also in, in bond yields. But that doesn't get us past the washing out process that has to occur first. That's what we're going to see over the next several quarters. And just to be clear here, that story of higher highs and higher lows, that's a multi-cycle process for you? Th that's looking out 20, the second half of 24, 25 and further out. We've got to get to next week first. <laughs> Let's try we and do that. We absolutely do. Chairman Powell, you're saying hard landing. You seemingly want to pause. It's not about what you think they should do, not about what I think they should do. What do you think they will do? I think with Credit Suisse on the table, they will pause. I think they should pause. I think hiking rates, either the ECB hiking rates this week or the Fed hiking rates next week, has the potential to be the greatest gaffe since the ECB hiked rates in June 2008. They were watching oil prices going up. I think they eventually went to 140 and they hiked rates to combat that while the entire global property market was melting under them. I've said this this morning, we talk a lot about Chairman Powell not being Burns. We need to talk about Lagarde trying not to be Trichet. The difference, as Mike McKee pointed out, is that inflation now is not where inflation was in 08 or 2011, particularly in 2011 going into the Eurozone debt crisis. Where does that leave the inflation story? I think inflation is now very backward looking. You're, you're seeing cracks form. You're seeing the liquidity and perhaps solvency of the banking system come under a lot of pressure. That's going to, going to cause businesses and consumers to pull back. I think you have to appreciate there's credit tightening going on at every single level. We know central banks have hiked rates, so they're tightening credit. You look at the banking system. 
the banking system, if you look at senior loan officer surveys, they've been tightening credit. And in the aftermath of this week, they're going to tighten it further. And then you look at the non-bank lenders, the people in the bond market, me, the private credit people, we're assessing all of this. We're going to be tightening credit conditions further as well. There's nowhere for growth and inflation to go. This is happening on the 12-month anniversary of the first hike of this cycle tomorrow. It's a year tomorrow. They've done more than 400 basis points in 12 months. Wasn't showing up in the data in a material way. There was still a real debate about no landing, all that stuff, and it sounds ridiculous now, a week after this. You said problems a little bit earlier. You used that word problems. Can you be specific about what kind of problems you're anticipating now? Well, th there are things right under our nose. If, if you look at the regional banking system, we've been watching deposit outflows for a couple of months now. The other thing that should be obvious to everyone is there's a structural problem in the commercial property market, particularly central business district office space. We know in many, many cities it's largely vacant. Those were flagship properties. They're sitting in a lot of REITs, a lot of securitizations. They'll probably have to be written down. We've already seen a couple things happen. You've got the Blackstone REIT. You've got the CMBS transaction. There are other things out there that will surface over the next couple quarters. Let's put some dots together. I remember the last couple of months you warned about this in private markets. And I asked you about how this might manifest in public markets. When those issues come about, and they finally mark to market in the way that you anticipate. How do you think this is going to spill over to public markets? Well, I, I think in a couple of ways. I, I think certainly there's contagion. So people uh, will sell what they think will experience the second and third round effect. I think the public markets, as we're seeing, remain one of the few outlets for uh, quick de-risking. So you can go in and get down in your high yield allocation. You can sell equities. Um, I think the public markets will serve as a buffer for potential write downs in the private markets. So where and what is safe right now? High quality duration. I, I think Treasuries. for sure. For sure. I, and I think I said this last time um, I was on. I wouldn't be surprised if in August the entire Treasury curve is 3 percent. That may now actually happen faster. Well, it all has a three handle now. It's yeah, out to 30. Yeah, but, and I thought 3 percent flat. I don't think you have to give up and carry in a lot of places. There are still a lot of high quality borrowers in the investment grade corporate space. You can pick those up at a percent and a half higher, live with a little volatility. Um, and also in, in the securitized credit, the mortgage backed space. If you do your analysis, there's a lot of credit enhancement there. You can pick up another percent and a half to two percent, but I would stay very, very high quality. You don't fancy the regional bank debt in this country? I think I lived through the SNL crisis in the late 80s, early 90s, and it feels like the U.S. banking system goes through this every so often. A consolidation has to occur. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that's an eventual outcome. There are other places for me to invest. Bob, let's hope we talk some more through the next couple of weeks, because next week's going to feel like a month or maybe even a decade. Bob, this was awesome. Thank you. Bob Michael of J.P. Morgan Asset Management, Credit Suisse right now. For those of you following at home, we're down about 28 percent over in Swiss trading. Here in the United States, about 14, 15 minutes into the session, we're lower by 1.2 percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down. I say only nine tenths of one percent. I say only because there's some big things developing. First Republic has been followed very carefully over the last week or so. That was halted for volatility after pairing a drop of 15 percent. The drop to 15 percent is just unbelievable. So we've seen some big moves here in the bond market too. Two year yield down 37 basis points, 388. Coming up, Credit Suisse plunging to a record low. It's top shareholder ruling out a bigger stake. Absolutely not. For many reasons, outside the simplest reason, which is regulatory and statutory. That conversation up next with Amundi's Monica Defend. Absolutely not. For many reasons, outside the simplest reason, which is regulatory and statutory. We now own 9.8% um, of the bank. If we go above 10%, all kinds of new rules 
kick in, whether it be by our regulator or the European regulator or the Swiss regulator, and we're not inclined to get into a new regulatory regime. Absolutely not. And that was the response from the Saudi National Bank chairman telling Bloomberg it has no interest in providing more assistance to Credit Suisse. Shares of the Swiss bank plunging to new record lows, along with its bonds now trading at distressed levels. On top of the story all morning, Jan Patrick Barnett joins us from Frankfurt. Jan Patrick, have we heard from this bank yet this morning? Well, we haven't really, and that's the story of Credit Suisse, isn't it? That whenever there's a headline out there that's not doing well for the stock, the bank is not like uh, very forceful to to come out and, and and give us any color and and any reassurance about about its business and its plan and and its everything. Uh, again, like we had this, this interview with the the CEO the other day, where he urged that his turnaround plan is is for three years, not for a couple of months, which is all uh, well and good, but. In this moment, it's really hard for Credit Suisse to um, be able and, and convince people that they are uh, in a position to, to turn this around with everything that is happening. If the economy is now slowing, we probably get a recession, um, then it's going to be even harder. Stock is down 25 percent, a somewhat of a recovery. Jan Patrick Banner out of Frankfurt. Jan Patrick, thank you. 169. Monica Defender Mundi joins us right now. Monica, thanks for your patience as we work through some of these issues. Are there opportunities on the screen in front of you at the moment? Well, there are so many uncertainties uh, in face of us that possibly I will stay patient and see what the ECB will deliver uh, next week, uh, what the Fed uh, will be will be doing. But for the time being, we maintain uh, our underweight into the equity position in so a cautious stance and a longer uh, U.S. duration bias. Monica, in the United States, some banks struggle to manage their duration risk. Do you think potentially? The same thing lurks beneath the surface in Europe. We think that the European story uh, is a bit different from the from the US one. In particular, the sector uh, seems uh, in a healthier position when you look at the liquidity buffers or also uh, the earnings profile. So what is happening today in uh, in Europe seems to us more uh, take profit and repositioning than anything else. Well, let's look at the repositioning. It's huge. In the Treasury market, the front end of the curve down 46 basis points. I'll get to the German curve briefly, going into the ECB tomorrow. We're down 42 to 242. Monica, what do you expect from Lagarde tomorrow? The ECB seemingly had pre committed to 50 basis points. Are they going to follow through with this playing out? Well, uh, as, as you can imagine, this is an open debate. Um, we are convinced, though, that uh, the ECB will continue and will hike. 50 basis, basis point. If not, uh, it might really imply a sense of fear of financial uh, instability. Inflation is still there, and there are other tools uh, that uh, the ECB might might use as a Fed, by the way. So the the balance sheet. So possibly uh, they will release a 50 basis point hike with a dovish tone. It would be appreci appreciable if they do not commit to any forward guidance because uh, the macro environment is too uncertain to pre-commit in, uh, in size and uh, potential hikes uh, in, in the future. What we don't think uh, will happen is that we will have a uh, cut uh, this, uh, this year. The market has been overshooting over the last 10 days. Um, we remain uh, on, on, on our side uh, quite firm, saying that rates uh, will go high. We see 350 uh, as a, a potential terminal rate for the, uh, for the ECB and wow. 520 yes, and 5.50 uh, for, uh, for the Fed. There's some big calls. Monica Defend of Amundi. Monica, thank you. Some big calls going into some tough decisions. There are no easy calls for President Lagarde and Chairman Powell. I've asked a couple of times already today, what would spook you more if the ECB went 50 or didn't hike at all after committing to a half percentage point hike for much of the last month or so. Equities right now on the S&P about 23 minutes into this. We are lower by 1.4% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down one four percentage point. The two-year in America, a two-year Treasury has been trading like a penny stock for the last week or so. We're down 40 basis points on a two-year. Up next on this programme, The Trading Diary. This conversation has shifted so quickly. Guests on this program, just like that, 
from no landing to hard landing. 25 minutes into the session, we're down 1.4% on the S&P on the Nasdaq. We're down 8 tenths of 1%. That's the price action. Here's your trading diary. Housing starts, another round of claims coming up tomorrow. Plus, an ECB rate decision, President Lagarde News Conference. Wow. What a difficult position that governing council is in. Secretary Yellen heading to Capitol Hill, then closing out the week with Umich sentiment. That survey coming on Friday. Looking ahead to next week, the big day. Fed rate decision, Chairman Pound News Conference coming up next Wednesday. I have no idea where we'll be a week from now. From New York City, thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. Good luck for the rest of the trading day.